Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home who welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy Since they are many, His mercy is of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cause we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more sins they are many his mercy is more for sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more good morning uh, before we continue let's let's pray Dear God, I thank you for another day of life. Um, I thank you that we can all come and worship together as a church body. Um, I pray that we would worship authentically um, and that we would bring anything that we're trying to hide or any sins we may be struggling with um, and just confess them to you this morning as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high, Lord, I lift your name saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee i only design thy draws to consume and thy gold to refine the soul that on jesus hath leaned for repose that's all
God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future. My life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. My life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river I'm gonna fight life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. My life is worth the living just because he lives. Voices only. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know we hold the future. My life is worth the living just because he lives my life is worth the living just because he lives god thank you for loving us thank you for dying for us thank you for letting us live in you amen you may be seated uh, we're gonna have a missionary, also my brother-in-law, Dan Paul Berg, come up and share.
Wait, 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 wait. We're going to pray for you. We want to pray for you. We're going to pray for him, okay? Do you guys stand with us? It'd be great. Father God, we want to thank you for what you've done for us through Christ, and we want to thank you for the way you reach into people's lives, and you, Lord, you, you invigorate them, you give them life, you empower them, and then, Father, you use them, you use us for your glory, and we thank you for Dan, and, and Lord, the ministry, uh, Lord, that he and Valora have amongst couples, amongst men, amongst people who don't know you, amongst people who do know you, and we thank you for being able to be a part of all that. Lord, we want to ask your blessing upon them, upon their marriage and upon their family. Father, I want to ask that you would continue to allow them to see fruit, that maybe fruit that nobody else would ever see or know, but they would know that your hand is upon them, and they would have a sense of blessing as that takes place. We pray that you'd multiply that ministry. We pray that it would grow, that your kingdom would continue to grow. And so, Father, we just thank you for the chance to partner with these guys and what they're doing in, in another part of the world, it's just down the road, but it's still another part of the world. But, Father, we just thank you for what you're doing there. Jesus, bless these folks, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. Man, wasn't it cool having a saxophone up here? That was awesome. I was like, wow, look at that thing go. That was pretty cool. Oh, good morning. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, would you continue in prayer with me right now? Uh, Father, we have gathered in this place, and we are excited to be here and to, uh, to see one another and to get a chance to hear from your word and to sing worship and praise to you. And Lord, we're mindful that uh, on the other side of the world from us, uh, there is a war that's taking place. And that there are brothers and sisters in Christ who uh, some have fled, some are fighting, but Lord, who uh, bear your name and are our brothers and sisters. And Father, who are people that we will spend eternity with, and uh, we want to lift them before you right now. And Father, I want to pray in particular that you would use your church uh, in that part of the world to proclaim hope and to proclaim uh, your victory through Christ and to proclaim the goodness of who you are and your provision to people around who are scared, who are frightened, and some who have fled, and, and there are all the things that are going on in that place. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, you would give to the church there a mighty testimony about who you are and about your provision and care for others. And Father, we pray that you'd bring an end to this, this conflict, this war. We pray, Father, that uh, you would not allow evil to befall. We pray, Father, that you would stop those forces that would want to destroy life. Um, Lord, we read in your word what causes war when we become greedy and self-centered and focused. And Father, we pray that you would turn that upside down, that this is not of you, and that, Father, you would be receiving glory in the midst of just this devastation that's going on. Father, we pray also for uh, other leaders around the world who have an opportunity to influence and to have their countries influence things. We pray that they would seek after you. Lord, we know that, that you use, uh, Lord, you use everybody. You use people who don't know you yet for your glory. Uh, but Lord, we pray for those who, who do know you that they would, Lord, they would grab hold of, Lord, the values of your kingdom and they would put those forth. And we pray, Father, for those who don't know you that, that Lord, as they, as they seek after truth, they would find Jesus. They would find you and they'd come into the kingdom. And Father, there'd be transformation taking place. Father, it's sobering to think about what's going on there right now. And Father, we, I just think about folks even here at home and, um, Lord, just the, the things that we go through. The things that are heavy on our heart, sometimes physically, sometimes emotionally, sometimes socially. God, there's, there's things that are heavy on our hearts. And, and Father, I just thank you that you're a God who, who meets us exactly where we are. You know, if you have things that are on your heart this morning as you came in here, would you just take those before the Lord? Would you talk with him about those right now? And Father, we ask that today as we look into your word that you'll 
teach us, that you'll speak to us, that you'll give us insight that we wouldn't ordinarily have if it were not for your Holy Spirit. God, thank you. I love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Oh, man, spring's here, yeah? Man, amen. That was a pretty weak amen. Okay. Spring's here, right? There we go. Okay, now we're talking. So yesterday, uh, a couple neighbors stopped by over at the house, and, and as they stopped by, we got in this conversation. It was late in the afternoon, and, and you know, this always happens when you're trying to get something done, but that's okay. And uh, so at any rate, they stopped by, and in the course of the conversation, what goes on is uh, he, he says, he goes, man, I just, I hate death. I hate death. I hate cemeteries. I hate everything about it. I mean, I know, I know there's coming a time when it's just your time to go, then you go. And he's going on about this, and, uh, and his wife goes on and starts to tell about her mom, who had died some time ago, but, but how she had written her own obituary, and it was 15 pages long. And at, the, and at the service, there was 15 songs that were sung. And she said, yeah, it was like three hours long. It just kept going, you know, it was this big, long service. And we're kind of sitting there talking and kind of checking out and trying to stay focused and all that good stuff, but... It's interesting because the Bible tells us that death is the last enemy. It's how Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says death is the last enemy. And so we know that that is the enemy of all man is, is death. And, and for the most part, we hate death. We look at it, we hate death. Now, as a believer, we can see it as this is why when, when we leave this life and we enter the presence of Christ, because the Bible tells us, uh, to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. So we know that truth, that reality, and so we, we get that. But for the most part, um, you know, people, we, we're not excited about death, you know. And a lot of people fear death. Um, there, we just know there's a lot of folks. In fact, I think over the last couple of years, one of the things that we have seen is we have seen that there have been a lot of folks because of COVID that have just been fearing death. Even Christians that have been afraid of death, afraid of dying, afraid of what's going to happen. And I think it's largely due to the fact of the unknown. There's this, well, what actually does happen? What is this existence really like? And we, you see movies about it, read books about it, read articles, and oh, what's this going to happen and everything. And so I think there's this, this kind of undercurrent that we, we get these messages about what it's like, but, but there's an uncertainty still. Do you fear death? I mean, yeah, it's people like, I don't want to die. But do you fear death? Uh, Benjamin Franklin, you know, he's quoted this, or he's, he's been cited with this, and, and actually he wasn't the first one to say it. There were some others, but he said this. He said, uh, our new constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And you've probably heard that from other places, and it was credited to him, and it's credited to Mark Twain, and credited to various different people along the way. But nonetheless, we've heard that. And yeah, we kind of look, and we kind of chuckle at it and say, yeah, okay, we get it. We understand that, that taxes are coming. The season's coming pretty quick, by the way. And that death, we know, is also coming as well. And we never know when it is, and it's never the right time. In fact, when anybody dies, it's never the right. We never say, oh, this is a great time. Nobody ever says that. And yet, death is inevitable for all of us. We know that it's coming at some point. Uh, I, the Bible also tells us, though, that, um, that this happens, and uh, just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, that there is a day coming. And so we know the truth of what God's Word says. That this is going to happen. And, there's, and, and with that, I mean, I think this also speaks to that whole issue. There's no transmigration. There's no reincarnation. You're not coming back afterward. That's not the way it works. You're going to die, then you're going to face the judgment seat. And, and that's kind of the way it is. That's not even kind of. That just is. And Jesus spoke out a lot about death. And, uh, and in particular about how we're saved from death. And what does that look like? And I'd like for you just to close your eyes for a moment right now, because I'm going to read a number of passages. Some are familiar to you, some are not. But I'd like you just to listen as I read some passages about what Jesus has said about how he has saved us. Because it's incredibly encouraging to think about this this morning. 
So just close your eyes and focus for a moment. I'm going to read through some passages. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus said to him, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. The thief comes only to steal, to kill excuse me, to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. These are all part of God's Word. Familiar with any of those? Heard any of those before? Memorized any of those before? The Bible's very clear. The Bible's very clear that death is a certainty. It is an absolute certainty. And and like I said before, you don't come back. You don't get like a you don't come back as another life form. That's not the way it works. And secondly, the Bible's very clear that Jesus is the only way to be saved from death. Those two things are just crystal clear in the Bible. It just comes out over and over and over. Uh, What I'd like you to do is grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts to our study this morning. We're going to be in Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 7. And we're continuing our story here. We've been talking about Stephen and what goes on with Stephen. And there's some really significant things in this that are very simple that we forget about, but I want to encourage us this morning, even as I was reading and praying and studying this week, and it was so encouraging just to my own heart, thinking about death and thinking about what that looks like. And, you know, it, it, in our family, it's been a, a couple of years ago that my mom, you know, died and, and being there in that presence. And over the years, I have been at, at, at too many deaths. I've, I've just, I've been with people as they've died, and it's a hallowed moment. It's a sacred moment when they transfer from this life into eternity. And, and it's important to remember that, that all of us have eternal life. Everyone. If you know Christ, it's eternity with him. If you don't know Christ, it's still eternal. But it's away from Christ. So would you stand with me in honor of God's word as I read for us from Acts chapter 7, verses 54 and following. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city 
and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Father, speak to us today through your word. Give us hope. Give us courage. Amen. Stephen's death uh, comes, and we're familiar with this. It kind of leads up to that. We were talking a little bit about it. If you were to just flip your page over just so you can get kind of an idea of what's taking place, you go back into chapter 6, actually, and what you find is you find, first of all, the deacons were appointed, and those seven men, and it talks about Stephen and the character of who he was. We talked about that last week, about this, this, the, char- the strength of his character, about who he was inside and what caused him to have such a bold and courageous witness. So we talked a little bit about that. And then in chapter 6, what takes place is, is what he is communicating and then the message that he's proclaiming, it riles up the religious leaders. They don't like what he has to say. And so it's partly because of the message, but it's also, I think, because if you look down at verse 8 of chapter 6 and following, it's full of grace, full of power, doing wonders and signs among the people. He's got all these things going on. Later on, it talks about he was full of wisdom and full of the Spirit. And all of those things, all the manifestations of who he was and the way that was coming across was something that pushed the religious people away. Because as they look, the religious leaders are thinking, okay, he's gaining popularity. He's gaining interest with other people. People are turning to this Jesus as he talks about them, and they're turning away from us to him. And so there was this envy and there was this jealousy that was taking place among him. They didn't like that he was preaching. They didn't like that people were following Christ. They didn't like the fact that they were putting their faith in Christ. They didn't like this whole thing because the shift of the popularity is moving from them and their system uh, to something else. And see, the religious leaders at the time were the ones who, they were exploiting the people. They were the ones who had brought corruption into the temple. They were the ones who were charging taxes, and they were charging all kinds of things and and forcing people to do things that that they should never do, that the Scripture never told, that Jesus never talked about. That's why when Jesus was condemning the religious leaders and the Pharisees back in the Gospels, he told them, he said, you guys, you're adding all these things onto people's backs. You're making it harder for them to come to know God. You're making it more difficult. You're putting them at arm's distance. And he calls them all these different names in the midst of that, and he just doesn't hold back at all. But, but this is going on, and this is what's happening here at, at chapter, excuse me, chapter 6. And so they seize him, they seize Stephen, and what they do is they charge him. And, and they charge him with a couple different things. And, and here's what, here's what kind of happens here. They put these false charges against him. And, and essentially what they do is they say that, that what he is doing is he is blaspheming against several different things. And, and he says that, number one, they're blaspheming against Moses. Now, Moses would have been a patriarch, and, or was a patriarch, and Moses to them would have been very significant because he led, he rescued the nation of Israel, if you will, from uh, 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 from the captivity of, the, of Egypt. So he was one who came along and he rescued them and he delivered them out of the oppression that they were experiencing. So he was looked up to as somebody who was a savior in that sense. Okay? Then he talked about they was blaspheming God. They said they accused him of that. They said, well, he's accusing or he's blaspheming against God himself. And he's saying that God isn't really God and God doesn't really care and Moses didn't really do anything for us. He talks about this holy place. And as they're saying this, you've got to realize the context is they're standing in the temple. So he's saying that they've that they're saying about him that he is blaspheming this temple, that this temple is not the significance that it is. See, in the temple, there was the way it was set up with the inner court, the outer court, the holy of holies, and this whole belief that God was dwelling inside this holy of holies. And yet we know the scripture says that God doesn't dwell in temples built with human hands. He's outside of that. But Stephen, what they accused him of, was blaspheming the temple. And then lastly, that he was blaspheming the law, and the law throughout all of Scripture was given. And so this was given to point people back to God is what it was given. But in fact, they make these false accusations of Stephen. They say, well, he's been blaspheming all these different things. There's no more grievous accusation, false accusation, that they could put on a Jew anywhere than this right here. 
And so they put this upon Stephen. It's a false accusation, but they put it upon him, and this is what they charge him with, and they bring him up to this whole kind of a thing. And what Stephen was really doing was Stephen was promoting Jesus over all these things. See, what he was doing was, 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 was he was saying that, that, well, let's take a look here, because he goes into this when we get into the sermon itself, because then what happens is, in, in the first part of chapter 7, the high priest said, are these things so? So these charges have been given against Stephen. He's been brought into custody, and the chief priest says, are these so? Have you been blaspheming against these things? Is this what you've been doing? This is this big accusation. And it's all false accusations, because if you look back up in chapter 6, Look at verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak of blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up all the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came up to him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses. So all this was false. None of this was true, but they were generating all this energy to try to bring Stephen down, all because he was proclaiming the gospel. And so in the midst of that, these are the accusations that Stephen is facing. And so the chief priest, the first part of chapter 7, the chief priest said, are these things so? And this response in chapter 7 is Stephen's response, his sermon, if you will, is his message back to everybody who's there about, about his message of the gospel. And so this is what he's going to tell them. Now, he's going to do a couple things. This is his sermon, if you will. He does two things, basically. And the first thing that he does is he says that history, all of history, everything back to Abraham, because as you follow through the whole sermon, he starts at Abraham, he goes to Moses, he goes to Jacob, he goes to Joseph, he goes all the way through, and you just get this kind of this encapsulation of what the Jews would have been holding on to as history at that point. He says that history anticipated the the person and work of Jesus Christ and his opponent's response to this is nothing new. So what he's saying is all of history that you know, all of history that you've studied, all of history that has given you a sense of identity as a Jew, all of this is pointing toward Christ who's coming, and Christ is Jesus. That's who it is. So that's what he was saying. He's saying all of this is pointing toward that. All of that. I'm not blaspheming anything. I'm just letting you know that everything in history is pointing toward this. And he also tells him, he says, and the response that you're giving now is the same response that the Jews have given for all this time. Over all of history, there's been a rejection of God. So that's, what he's, that's the message. And the second part of it is he says this. He says the temple and the law was fulfilled by Christ when he brought with himself the new covenant. So what he's saying is he's saying, look, it's when Jesus came and he said, you know, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And Jesus himself was the temple because what happens is the temple is where all the sacrifice took place. So you'd come in, if you sinned, you came in, and the priest would offer a sacrifice on your behalf. Where in the temple? Well, Christ is the ultimate sacrifice, pays the penalty for that. So the, the temple and the law, everything that they were following was all pointing toward Christ. And that's the message that Stephen has. And if you take a look at chapter 7, and I encourage you to read it again. If you didn't read it this week, you should read it. But that's basically what it's going to come down to, is that history is anticipating Jesus as being the Christ. And that the temple and the law, all those things, everything that's there, all that stuff is fulfilled by Christ. And so essentially what he's saying is this. He is saying, he's saying that Jesus is better than Moses, okay? Because uh, everything, the prophets, the patriarchs, were all pointing toward being fulfilled in Christ. He's saying that Jesus is better than the law because everything in the law was pointing toward being fulfilled in Christ. And Jesus is better than the temple because everything in the temple was pointing people to being fulfilled in Christ. So what he's doing is he's making the connection back to all the things that God has given to these people, all the things that God has used to illustrate to these people who he is and his love for them and his plan for them. And he's saying all those things are fulfilled in Christ. That's the message. That's basically the message of his sermon there. Now, I want you to jump forward with me and go to verses 51 and 51 through 53. Because he goes through this whole message. He goes through what Moses had done. He goes through all the things that are taking place, even the golden calf and all those kinds of things. And then look at verses 51 through 53. Now, keep in mind, this is a man, Stephen, who has a courageous witness, but this is an incredibly courageous witness because now he's on trial in front of all the religious leaders. The chief priest has him there, and he's just delivered a defense for the accusations, the false accusations they've given to him. But look at what he says to him. He says, you stiff-necked people. 
uncircumcised in heart and ears, because that was a, that was a symbolic, the, the circumcision in the Old Testament was a symbolic of being cutting away, and it was a sense of, of identification with who God was as his chosen people. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. This is nothing new. You, you've always been doing this, and you're doing the same thing again. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Interesting study. Go back and read about the prophets and the persecution that they faced. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous ones, the ones who had messianic prophecies about Christ coming and Jesus being the Christ. And the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered because the Jews had crucified Christ, as we read about at the end of the Gospels. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Man, he just goes right at them. He says, look, here's the thing. Your fathers, your ancestors, all these people you claim that they were right on with. No, they, uh -uh. they were not there. And you're the same way. You're the exact same way. And so he takes this whole thing and he turns it on their ear and turns it on an ear for them. And, and what's interesting about this is that is their response. Because, because their response to this is that they are enraged when they hear it. I mean, they bring these accusations and they say, hey, here's, here's who, you know, here's this guy. He's, he, everything he's doing is wrong. He's blaspheming. He's putting down the temple. He's putting down the law. He's putting down everything that we hold sacred. He's putting it all down. And it's all false. But then what happens is, is that uh, he comes back at them. I was thinking earlier back in chapter 2 of Acts. Do you remember the part where uh, it says that they were, they were cut to the heart? They were cut to the heart. And when they were cut to the heart, they were, they were softened. But here, when they're cut to the heart, they're hardened. Their hearts get even harder. Even, even, even more intense. They grind their teeth. And grinding their teeth is always, always, it's an expression of, of hatred. And you're not supposed to use absolutes, but you can use that for this. Um, and the people are enraged at him, but it says that he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He sees Jesus. And, and, and when he sees Jesus, because as we read earlier, when he sees Jesus, he, it says he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God as if he's been sitting next to God. And then all of a sudden he stood up and he's looking, he sees Jesus standing there as if to welcome him in, as if to say, okay, you're coming. And you know what? I'm here. And what a reminder to Stephen to be able to say, this is the Jesus who I've been following. This is the Jesus who I'm proclaiming. This is the Jesus who, who you know what? Nothing is going to happen to me outside of the sovereign will of God. Nothing is going to take place. And here's Jesus and he's standing there. And Stephen looks up, he says, I see Jesus standing there. And man, they get furious. Absolutely furious. You can't, you can't see God. You can't see where he's at. You can't see what's... You're, you're doing the same thing. You, you cannot, this is impossible, can't be happening. And they rush him. And the same response is the same response that their fathers had given and you know what? This is the same response that people give to the gospel when they hear it if their heart hasn't first been regenerated by the Lord. See, what happens is God is regenerating hearts. And in the process of doing that, process of bringing people to himself, he's regenerating hearts. And when they hear the message, then they respond to the message in a positive way. But they, if they haven't been regenerated, this is exactly what happens. They become enraged. They become angry. They start grinding their teeth. They're furious at the whole, they're, they're even thought of it because it's like, how could you possibly say that you have a connection with God? How could you possibly say that God's not an evil ogre that hates us? How could you possibly say that God's a loving God? And that's exactly what goes on here because our hearts aren't regenerated yet. And it's not until God's regenerating a heart that when they hear the message, then it's soft. And when it's pierced, it says, oh, yes. This is what it means. And then repentance comes. But in this case, that's not the case. And so in the midst of what's going on here, and he sees all these things happening, a couple things go on. Um, in the face of death, and what, I, what strikes me about this that's so interesting is that it's almost as if Stephen is unaware of the danger. It's almost like he's oblivious to the fact that these people want to kill him. 
And I don't know if that's the case or not. It doesn't say it in there, but it just doesn't seem like he does because as he's going along, he's proclaiming the gospel. He, he tells them what the history says. He tells them who God is. And he, then he challenges them. He says, you guys are all stiff-necked. You're not listening to the message of the gospel. And he's not even, he's, he's not even aware of the fact that his life is in the balance, it feels like. And so he's facing death. And he just continues to go, and he's as courageous with his witness as he is courageously facing death, as he's facing this, this final earthly experience that he's going to have. And these are the things that happen to him. Number one, he gets a view into heaven. Like I said, he sees Jesus. And here's Jesus at the right hand of God. Nothing is going to happen to me outside. What a, what a reassurance. What a reassurance to Stephen as he's there and he's sitting there, maybe he's starting to connect the dots because guys are picking up rocks, so they're getting ready to take him out. And, and as this is happening, you know, he sees Jesus. And what a reassurance to say, okay, there's Jesus. And you know what? Nothing is going to happen to me outside of your sovereign plan for me. Nothing is going to happen. I'm, I'm absolutely immortal until, until it's your call. Secondly, I think the thing that happens is, is that he cries out to Jesus, and he cries out and he says, receive my spirit. You know the worst thing, the worst thing that anything, anybody can do to you? You know the worst thing anybody can do to you here on this earth is send you to Jesus. That's the worst thing anybody can do. Like, the, like the, that's, that's it. The, like, that's the worst thing. What an amazing, isn't that power? It's powerful to think. That's, that's all that's going to happen. Okay, you're going to take my life? That's fine. I'm going to Jesus. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so here's this picture that he has. And he says, and he, okay, that's all right. And he says, and he says, okay, this is coming. Now he's realizing it's happening. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What a beautiful thing. I've been with people when this has happened. I've been with people when, and praying with them and, and as they're right on their deathbed and as they're dying and as, as, as the physical earthly life fades out. And, and, and it's, like I said, it's a hallowed moment. But to be able to just with confidence be able to say, Lord, receive my spirit, I'm coming home. And then the third thing that he does, he prays for the people that are murdering him. He prays for them. I mean, doesn't that sound familiar? Jesus is on the cross. What does he do? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. But he prays for the people that are actually taking his life, his earthly life. And, and Stephen, in the face of death right here, there's this marked shift that we're going to see from this point forward in the book of Acts. The gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. The, the Christians who are here in Jerusalem are going to get spread. And all of a sudden, this magnificent story of who God is and his plan for all mankind is going to get spread around the entire world. And this is kind of a hinge pin for that whole thing. And it becomes a catalyst for sending Christians everywhere. And, and it's, it's fascinating to think that he has this amazing picture of courage. Like there's no sense of fear in death at all. He's facing death, and there's no sense of fear with it. There's none. He has zero fear. He sees who Christ is. He knows who he is. He knows what Christ has done for him. He knows he has peace and relationship with him. And he's just, he's just confident. He's like, oh, this is okay. This is, this is fine. No fear. No fear. It's an amazing picture. Hold on to all that and turn with me to John chapter 8. <clears throat> John chapter 8, it's a story that we're familiar with. You may or may not be familiar with. It's a, <clears throat> it's a story that um, your Bible may have a little note that says this particular story is not in the earliest manuscripts, but it went through the canon of Scripture, and I believe it is part of Scripture for us. I believe that God has a message for us through this, but follow along with me. It's the story of the woman who's caught in adultery. Okay, follow along, please. Starting at verse 2. Early in the morning, he came, out, came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to him who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Jesus, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. 
Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they now? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Don't you love this story? You know, put, put aside her actual sin, the sin of adultery, and just take on just the picture of sin that's there. It's, it's interesting to think because there's, there's several things about this story that I, I, think, I think fit into where we're going and what we're talking about today. Uh, this, this woman, um, she's, she's caught in adultery and, and she's caught in the actual act or whatever's taking place there. And uh, she's caught in her sin. There's a realization uh, by those around her, but also by herself, that she is sinful. And again, like I said, take out, just take out the adultery part and just put in sin in general. I mean, I know it says, and that's fine, but, but sin in general, because here's the thing, it's like, Every one of us has been caught by sin. It may not be adultery, but it's sin. The Bible tells us that for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. There's not a person, there's none righteous, no, not one. Every single one of us is sinful. Every single one of us has committed sin. Every single one of us are in the exact same boat as this woman because we've committed sin. This is so these religious leaders bring to him and they say she was facing death. Because the wages of her sin, according to the law, was death. And, and so because of that, she was facing death. And it was going to be a stoning death. It was going to be a brutal death. It was not going to be some, uh, some kind of gentle or kinder death. It was going to be a very, very brutal death. But here's the thing. It's like every one of us is facing death. Every single one of us, because of our sin, are facing death. Like the option that you have is not any of them. The option is, is that you're separated from God because of your sin, and the only way to get off that hook is for that to be paid for, that debt to be paid for, for your sin to be paid for by somebody else, by, by only one, the perfect one, the sinless one. It's the only way it can be paid for. You can't pay for it, I can't pay. Only Jesus can pay for it. But every single one of us has a death sentence upon us. Because of our sin. And she was saved by Jesus. Because Jesus stepped in between her and the accusations of death that were coming at her and saved her. And the fact of the matter is, is that every one of us can only be saved by Jesus. Like, there's nothing you can do. She knew there was nothing that she could do. There was absolutely nothing that she could do against this religious group that was there. Likely as all men, likely would have overpowered her. Likely they would have just thrown her down and stoned her because she was caught in adultery. But nonetheless, Jesus steps in between her and her sin and rebuffs death and it goes back and now she is saved and she tells him, go and sin no more. What a beautiful picture. Amazing that Jesus steps in between us and our sin and he, because he died for us and he protects us from that and gives to us life. So yes, the question, it comes back, you go, so how do you face death with courage? I mean, how, how does that work? You know, how do I, I, I the, the, the neighbors that came by and we talked to them, I've talked to them before, I've prayed with them before, they've had different sicknesses, I've gone in their house and prayed with them, I've shared the gospel with them, talked, they've got some religious background, but, but how, do you, how do you face death? I mean, looking forward at that, the life that we have, none of us know how many days you have. None of us know if, you're, if it's going to end on the way home from church today. We've had funerals here at the church. We've all been to all. But how do you face death 
with some level of courage? How do you face death like Stephen faced death? Like, how do you do that in such a way that that you're almost oblivious to the fact that your human life is coming to an end, and and, and it's going to be over, and and there's no fear. There's just absolutely zero fear. How do you do that? And I I think there's a couple things. How do we do that? I think the first one is this. As Jesus said, we believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what the Bible tells him. In fact, he told him, he said, when when he's talking about going to create a place for us, he he said, don't be troubled. Don't, don't be fearful. Um, believe in God. Believe also in me. And he goes on to say, in my father's house are many mansions. And he, that whole passage in John 14. And he talks about that whole picture. And so there's this belief. And Stephen had this belief. Stephen had this understanding that the prophetic messages, the messianic, the messianic uh, prophetic messages of the Old Testament were all fulfilled in Christ. And so he was proclaiming the nature of, of who God was in Christ. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. God was living inside of him. He had experienced it firsthand. And he had this belief in Christ. Now, I just read to you like 15 passages earlier on that talk about the fact that Jesus is, in fact, God. That he is the only way that we can be saved, and that's where it comes from. So it's belief in Jesus is the first thing. That's the very first. I would be, man, I would be remiss. I realize that, that we know most of everybody here. I don't know everybody here. We know most. But there, you may be here, and maybe you don't yet know Christ. And maybe you're living in fear of death. And you're looking at it saying, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to come. You're talking crazy talk about this Stephen guy who is out there. And he's not afraid of dying. But he was not afraid of dying because he had a belief in Jesus. And I plead with you, if you don't know Jesus, and you have this fear in your life, this overwhelming fear in your life, that's why the fear is there. Because it's not a belief in Jesus being the Messiah, the one who can pay ultimately for your sin. The one who covered your death. That's where it starts. There's there's no other place. There's no other name given among men by which you must be saved. That's Jesus. That's the only name. There isn't anything else. There isn't any amount of work you can do. There isn't any amount of church you can attend. There isn't any amount of Bible verses you can go to. There isn't any Christian organization you can work for. There's nothing else you can do to be spared from death except for believe in Jesus. That's all there is. You need to hear that. You need to know that. Because if you're here and if you're fearful about what's coming and what's the future look like and what, what if I get sick, what if I die, what happens, you need to know that the only way that you have courage facing death starts with having a belief in Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing you need to know is this, is you need to die to yourself. Now that comes along with putting belief in Christ. But Paul said in Galatians, he said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. So what happens is is that we die to ourselves. When you say yes to Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you no longer, you're a dead person at that point. It's now Christ living through you. So all of a sudden, the rights that you claim and the rights that you think you have and all those kinds of earthly things that we go on, those are all gone. Those are, those, are, those are no longer part of the deal because we're dead to ourselves. We're alive to Christ. We're dead to ourselves. And what happens is, man, we get a hold of that thing and we think, man, these are, these are the rights that I have and I'm going to cling on to those rights. This is, this is mine. I'm going to hold on to this fast. And we cling to those things thinking somehow it's going to give us meaning or satisfaction or somehow it's going to give us significance and we hang fast to those things. And the fact of the matter is, is that we are dead to ourselves. But we're alive to Christ. That's a whole different picture because if you're not living for yourself, then you got nothing to lose. You're looking forward. You're saying, hey, man, this is, I see Jesus. And, and he's saying, hey, you know what? Nothing's going to happen to you outside of my sovereign will because it's not about you. It's all about me. And the last thing I think that we do to get this courage when it's facing death is we walk in obedience to Jesus' words. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And earlier as I was reading through those passages, he talked about this picture of, wow, this obedience. Because if you're living, and and if you're not living yourself, you're living for Christ, that means that the, the values, the ethics, the agenda of the kingdom become everything that you live your life for. You live your life in that direction. And because you're living your life in that direction, because that's the way you're living, because it's his agenda, not your agenda, you're walking in obedience to him. You're not even worried about other stuff that goes on. So whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It's the sovereignty of God. When he's going to work in my life, when, he's going to, when, I, when my life comes to an end, when I'm going to die, that's all in his hands. And you know what? When it happens, it's going to be fine because I'm going to be in the presence of Christ. Absent from the body, presence with the Lord. 
Isn't it amazing what God has given to us? I mean, there is a way to walk through life with a courage facing death that Stephen had. We don't have to have this fear. We don't have this paranoia. We don't have to have this, yeah, I wonder when it's going to happen. We don't have to even have a fear of, is it going to be painful? We don't have to have any of those kinds of things because there is this courage that God can give to us through Christ when we're facing life. And man, you look at, you look at life and you think, okay, how many more days? What will it be like? We focus sometimes on the death part of it rather than on the eternal part of it. What is it going to be like? When will it happen? What will the joy be like? What will the connection be like? I was thinking about that vision that Stephen had as he looked up into heaven and he sees Jesus and he says, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And not in a flippant way, not in a sarcastic way, or anything, but just here we go. I love you. And you know what? You're coming home. You're coming home. And praise God for what he's done for us. Praise God for what he's done for us. Oh, man. Would you pray with me? Father, here's a man who we read about, Stephen, our brother in Christ, who we're going to spend eternity with and worshiping you with. And, and Lord, we read about the courage that he had as he faced a violent death. And Lord, we, we, it's easy for us to say, oh, I'm not fearful, I'm not afraid. But Lord, sometimes the way we live, sometimes the things we try to do, and the, oh God, it just, it, just, it just seems as though we are fearful so often. And Father, I pray that you would give to us the courage that we see in Stephen. And, and Lord, we, there's other people in the Bible that we see it as well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who you know, bow down and worship or else we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Even if our God doesn't rescue us, we're still not going to worship you. There's no fear in death. And Father, you have given to us no fear in death because of Christ. And Lord, I thank you and I praise you and I praise you for that message that just, just, just resonates through your word that you have proclaimed life over us through Jesus. And Lord, I want to pray this morning for those folks who don't yet know you. And if you're here today, and if you don't know Christ, and, and, and even as I was talking, and we were talking about, it starts with a belief in Jesus. If you're not at that spot, until you come to grips with who Jesus is as the Christ, as the Messiah, the one who died in your place for your sin, so you could have a relationship with God, until you come to grips with that, you will have fear of death, and it will not go away. And, and real easy, you, you, all you do is you say, God, I'm, I'm hearing this. Lord, you've been regenerating my heart. I don't want to be, uh, Lord, I, I want to be soft. I want to receive this message. I don't want to be like these guys we just read about and reject it. I don't want to get hardened. I don't want to gnash my teeth against you. Lord, God, if you've made a way for me to have a relationship with you because of Jesus taking my penalty for my sin, Lord, I, I want to accept that. I want to, I want to say yes to that. I want him to become the boss in my life, the Lord in my life. And you just talk to him about that, and he'll do it. And you just confess, Lord, I'm a sinner, and, and change me. Transform me. Give me a new heart. And then we die to ourselves. We say, God, I realize that now, okay, what that means is not about me anymore. It's all about you. So teach me what it means to, be, to crucify myself and be alive to Christ. It's no longer me. It's no longer my plans, my agenda, my thoughts, my goals, anything. It's, it's all about you, Jesus, and it's all about your kingdom. And then we walk in obedience. We walk away from sin because the Holy Spirit's prompting us constantly. And as he prompts us, we walk away from our sinfulness and we walk toward life. Oh, Father, I just pray for those who are here today who, who Father, maybe have prayed that. Maybe, it's, maybe this is brand new to them. Maybe they've prayed that this morning. And I ask, Father, that your spirit as you indwell them and as you give to them life, Lord, you would, you would be reminding them of the great love that you have for them and the plans that you have for them and the way that you want to use them. And I pray that you'd give them a peace, Lord, even as Paul said, that surpasses all understanding that will guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father, that peace would overwhelm them and any fear of death that they've had would be lifted because of what is to come. And Father, I pray that you'd help us as a church to walk in obedience to Jesus' word. Father, thank you that this is all because of what you've done and not because of what we've done, because of what you've done through Christ. Thank you for the grace that you lavish upon us. We love you, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name.
Amen. Isn't God good? Man, God is so good. He is so good. Hey, there's uh we're gonna do we're gonna do something here. Uh we're gonna wrap stuff up here and then um yeah. Uh we're gonna wrap some stuff up. Uh let me give you a couple announcements here and then we're gonna sing. Uh, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on up and join me up here and then they're gonna they're gonna lead us and then I'll we'll leave after that. But um a couple things for you. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving. Thank you for um Supporting the ministry here of EBF financially and being a part of that. I mean, it just makes ministry happen, and I'm just so grateful to you. And, and we're watching ministry as it's coming out again, and we're being able to get going and Bible studies that are happening and some things that are going on. So thank you for giving. And you're able to do that. Uh, there's a black box in the back. You can give in the office. You can give online. You can give on the website. You can give on the app. And everything, the best way to do everything is on the app. That's the best way to do everything. And um, you, you, uh, you text to 779 uh, seven seven, and you just do uh, EBF only, and then you get the app, and then it goes from there. You can get sermons and all kinds of stuff. Uh, secondly, there's a number of Bible studies that are going on. There's a couple that take place on Sunday morning. There's some on Monday night. There's throughout the week. There's different times, and really want to encourage you to check some of those out. And you, again, go to the app or go to our web page, go to Facebook, and you can find out some of those things that are happening. You can ask me. You can ask Sean, and we'll help. We'd love to get you pointed. Ask Justin as well, and get some things going on there. Um, there's a men's group that meets on Monday night at 6.30 right here. There's a women's study that's meeting um, at Sunday mornings, and it's 8.15 starts and goes to 9.45. It's in Habakkuk and Haggai. That's, that started a couple weeks ago, but it's going, and you can still join that. Um, the couple study started this morning, and um, that's kind of cool, too. It's going through Gary Thomas's DVD series, and it's called Cherish. And it's going to be for the next six weeks from um, 9 until 10. And um, folks right up here in the front, you can talk with them. Wave. There we go. And you can talk with them if you want to give, be a part of that, and that'll be awesome. So, well, God is so good. Father, thank you for uh, your love for us. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for the body that you've given to us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to have fear and death. Uh, we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. I hope you have a great week. I love you very much. And if I don't see you before next Sunday, I'll see you next Sunday. But we'll stand together and we're going to sing and then uh, we're dismissed. So we're going to sing a new song. Um, we have a lot, we're given a lot of names for God. Um, and I think each of those names, uh, they kind of give us little hints as to who God is. Um, and so in Daniel, the Old Testament, uh, Daniel has a vision, and it talks about him coming before the throne of the Ancient of Days. And that just is referring to God as the one who was before time and the author of time. Uh, so this song has just been encouraging for me, just as there's so much going on in the world. Just remembering um, <clears throat> who the author of everything is. Uh, so I just wanted to read the chorus before we sang. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. <clears throat> For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the ancient of days.
his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name, for my God is the dread of night overwhelms my soul. He is here with me. I am not alone. Oh, His love is